taken into the compass of his Canterbury Tales the various manners and humors of the whole English nation, not a single character has escaped him, end quote. In the process of inventing English poetry as we know it, Chaucer presents his pilgrims on the road. England is a place in motion, a nation created by the imagination, by the stories people tell one another. It is these shared stories with all their humble realities that transform the British Isles to, in the words of Shakespeare's Richard II, dear earth. By the way, let's point out for your notes on page 8, do you see it there? I hope you write it down. There are some essential questions on the vocabulary. Do you see it? Do you see the word exile? I would write that word down. To be dislocated from home when you are away from the place you want to be, we call that exile. Geography, of course, a word that I hope you're familiar with, the physical features of a region. And pilgrimage, write that word down. A pilgrimage is a long journey to a holy or it can be just an important place. Let's keep going. Page 9 now. A second question. How does literature shape or reflect society? In the 10th centuries between the Germanic invasions and the dawn of the modern world, England changed from a place of warrior bands and invading tribes to a country ruled by a king, nobles, and bishops. Indeed, England was increasingly run and organized by merchants and landowners and their representatives in an evolving parliament. The literature written during this period reflects these changes. Let's take a look at the first question. How did writers capture a vanishing world of tribes and clans? The hero's code. Let's write it down. The hero's code. The world of the Anglo-Saxon epic poem Beowulf is that of the tribe and its leader. To become a leader, a young warrior must prove himself in battle. So Beowulf crosses the sea to aid his kinsman Rothgar, who cannot protect his people from the monster Grendel. After his victories over Grendel and Grendel's mother, Beowulf becomes the leader of his own tribe. Okay. Let's read our next um, heading. Vanishing World Enduring Values. The Beowulf poet tells a rousing story, but he also allows his listener to see and feel the world of the hero in both its glory and decline. At the end of the poem, Beowulf, with only the faithful young warrior Wiglaf at his side, battles a dragon and dies for his people. The audience knows that the poet is lamenting not only the death of a hero, but the passing of a hero's way of life. Let's go ahead and just make an observation that the Anglo-Saxon poem Beowulf is quite remarkable because at the end of it, the hero dies. Now think about how radical a notion that is. If you go to a movie where Spider-Man or Batman or Superman is the hero of the film, most of the time when they roll the credits, those heroes are still alive. Can you imagine a Jackie Chan movie where at the end of the movie, when he's got to go up against the bad guy, the bad guy just pulls out a 45 and boom, just blows him away. Jackie Chan's character falls down dead and they roll the credits. Most viewers of a text like that would say, no, 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 no. Jackie Chan is supposed to like jack all the bad guys and then walk away, usually cracking some kind of funky joke or something, right? The Anglo-Saxon poem Beowulf ends with the death of the hero, which in some ways will already begin to forecast the end of an era, the passing of a time. Think of it this way. By the time cowboy movies were being made out of Hollywood, there weren't any more cowboys living like in the old days. Right? Where they had the firearms and the pistols and shooting in the street and all that. By the time Hollywood is making movies about those cowboys, they're gone. They're gone. They're gone right? This is, this is the way it works, right? This is the way it works. In other words, we often will see this as happening in literature. In other words, literature is a way to try and capture something that's kind of gone. Going away, we might say. Which is really fascinating because you can think about your favorite movie and ask, your favorite video game, and ask. Your favorite TV show, and ask. Are they trying to capture something that no longer exists? It's somehow gone. It's changed in some fundamental ways. And world, the world I live in is different. And so I'm kind of looking backward going, gee, I wish it was still kind of like that. Now let's look at the British tradition close up on history on page 9. It's in this purple box again. 
And we're going to look at guilds and the status of women for just a second. So make a special note in your notes on this one. This is again on page 9. By the year 1000, merchants, traders, and artisans or crafts workers formed a new middle class ranked between nobles and peasants. So the first thing you want to say is, by about 1000, we start to see that pyramid that you wrote on your paper changing a little bit, okay? We're going to have at the very top, we're going to have those, uh, we're going to have those nobles, and then at the very bottom, we're going to have the peasants, but in between, we're going to have what will ultimately be called the middle class, okay? The craft guilds, um, the, the class gained power, we'll say here, the class gained power, in medieval towns with merchants and artisans forming associations called guilds. Let's write that down. A guild is an association of merchants or artisans, workers, workers. Okay. The way you can think about this is um, if, for example, they're doing work on the, uh, building a house. Maybe you've seen this before. When they build a house, they will bring in different groups of people to help build a house. Have you seen this? So, for example, they will bring in people to move the earth, for example, maybe dig the hole. Then they'll bring in another group of people to frame the house. Have you seen this? Then they'll bring in another group of people who will do the electrical work. Then they'll bring in another group of people who, for example, will paint the house. And then another group that will put the carpet or the flooring in the house. Are you familiar with this concept? That idea begins at roughly around 1000, where workers start to come together to form these guild fraternities, they're called. Let's keep reading. The craft guilds of artisans represented workers in one occupation, such as weavers, bakers, goldsmiths. Guild members made rules to protect the quality of their goods, regulate hours, and set prices. No one except guild members could work in any trade, and becoming a guild member took many years of labor. Guilds offered opportunities to women who worked in dozens of crafts and dominated some trades. Young girls became apprentices in trades such as ribbon making and paper making. Also, a woman often engaged in the same trade as her father or husband and might inherit his workshop if he died. Chaucer's wife of Bath, a weaver, represents this type of new middle class woman. We should just point out for our notes here that the emergence of the guild fraternity began the movement towards more freedom for women. Why? Because they could begin to do work outside of the domesticated status where most women of the time were expected to live make the meals, clean the house, raise the children. But with the emergence of the guilds, we begin to see for the first time women starting to kind of step outside of those bounds, gaining some freedom. I'm on page 10 now with you. How did Chaucer reflect social trends without preaching? And then our first heading, a poet in his world. Again, try and keep up with my reading. See if you can follow along. At the other end of the period, Chaucer provides the most complete example of the poet's interaction with his world. Chaucer's lifetime, the late 14th century, was a turbulent period in English history. The country suffered the devastations of the Black, of the Black Death, and Chaucer vividly describes that plague in The Pardoner's Tale. In the preaching of dissonant theologian John Wycliffe, the country also experienced a foreshadowing of the Protestant Reformation, the Protestant separation from the Catholic Church that would occur in the early 16th century. Wycliffe's criticisms of the church reflected a growing discontent with the showy wealth of some religious institutions. In the prologue to the Canterbury Tales, we meet a number of characters who represent various religious orders. Their sometimes questionable behavior suggests the controversy that would lead to the Reformation. Let's go ahead and write down two things here for your notes. First of all, John Wycliffe. Okay? He is going to be a preacher who is going to be one of the first early Englishmen talking about ideas of the Reformation. The Reformation, that is to say the reforming or the reworking of the Catholic Church. Chaucer is going to challenge the church. When we get to Chaucer and Canterbury Tales, we'll see this. Showing, back to the, back to the uh, uh, page 10, showing, not sermonizing. Chaucer, however, does not rant, rave, or preach about corruption among religious orders or other social ills. Instead, he shows us characters like the monk who spends more time hunting and feasting than praying and fasting. Political turbulence. In 1381, England was shaken by the Peasants' Revolt, in which 
farmers and laborers demanded a greater share in the wealth and governance of the country. King Richard II put the rebellion down only to lose power himself 18 years later. London, originally a Roman settlement on the banks of the, of the Thames River, had by this time grown into a great city and a center for international trade. I would write down 1381 and the Peasants' Revolt. The peasants get tired of being subjugated and they revolt, right? They wanted more of a share of the wealth, okay? Richard II does put down the rebellion, but he loses power himself 18 years later. Okay. The next heading, rising middle class. Part of this tumult and change involved the replacement of feudal roles, such as knight and serf, with a newly empowered urban middle class. Chaucer himself was a member of this newly rising group, as is one of his most remarkable characters, the wife of Bath. The writer in society. Writers often address social issues, but not as sociologists. Writers are interested in the human stories, the individual tale, rather than the mass phenomenon. Readers are often left to figure out who or what is to blame or praise. The turbulent history of the later Middle Ages is contained in Chaucer's pilgrimage between the lines. Again, let's point out the essential question vocabulary on page 10. You have the word sociologist. I hope that you have that one in your notes. Of course, this is a person who studies societies or groups. You have the word turbulent, which means kind of full of commotion or disorder, wild disorder. You have the word feudal, relating to a system in which overlords granted land to lesser lords or vassals in return for military service and in which poor farmers worked the land for vassals. Let's go to page 11. We are continuing with our questions. Make sure you have this one in your notes. What is the relationship of the writer to tradition? You may first have encountered King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table in a book, a movie, a comic strip, or even a multiplayer game. Their stories have been told reverently and irreverently for over a thousand years. Uh, probably the irreverently that's most famous is Monty Python's Holy Grail. For those of you that don't know, we'll be studying that fun uh, movie as we go. These tales, in other words, are traditional. They've been handed down. The word tradition comes from the Latin traditio, meaning to hand over, to transmit. Trans tradition in literature, however, does not simply refer to what a writer receives from the past. It also refers to what a writer does with the inheritance. Question, how do writers change what they have inherited? Notice the heading, bequest from the past. The King Arthur stories are a kind of bequest from the past, different authors accepting this literary inheritance but decided to use it in different ways. For example, the poet who wrote Sir Gawain and the Green Knight, a text that we will be studying later, has his knight hero submit to a series of tests that teach him something about himself. The tests come from earlier folk tales and romances or adventure stories about knights, and the poet weaves them into a seamless whole. Sir Thomas Mallory, we want that name for sure in our notes. Mallory, M-A-L-O-R-Y. Sir Thomas Mallory, writing in the 15th century at the end of the age of chivalry, you will want that word as well in our notes, chivalry. What the Code of Knights, uses Arthurian legend in a different way. In his book, Mort to Arthur, which means the death of Arthur, Mallory gathers many legends of Arthur and his companions to write an elegy or farewell to the era of the knights. Back to our comment about when Hollywood was making movies about cowboys, that era or that epoch was gone. And by the time that Mallory is writing about the knights, there aren't really those kinds of knights living in that way anymore. Changing in the telling, the last heading on page 11. The much earlier Anglo-Saxon epic Beowulf also ends on a note of farewell with the dying hero deserted by all but one faithful follower. It's easy to imagine how this story grew in the retelling. Perhaps in the earliest recitals, the hero sails across the sea to rescue his kinsmen and kill the monster. Then, as new audiences clamor for more, the storyteller adds more exploits. Now Beowulf must also pursue and kill the monster's mother. Still later, in an episode aided by another teller, 
Beowulf is mortally injured by a dragon. Finally, the monk or monks who copy the tale alter it further, adding Christian elements from their own tradition. Just put in your notes that we'll see what we call the curse of Cain when we meet the Grendel monster. Let's go to page 12. How did Chaucer respond to and create literary traditions? Using the old. Keep reading with me on page 12. Geoffrey Chaucer is the supreme literary artist of the English Middle Ages because he's both indebted to traditions and committed to creating them. Consider the idea of his major poem, The Canterbury Tales. A varied group of people are thrown together and agree to tell stories to pass the time. In 1353, an Italian author, Boccaccio, had used the same format in his collection of stories, The Decameron, in which a group of aristocrats flee to a castle to avoid the plague and agree to tell one another a hundred tales. Chaucer knew Italian literature and the work of Boccaccio. The idea of a group of stories held together by a frame story is his inheritance. The only thing we need to write down here is that Chaucer is going to use Boccaccio, the great Italian writer, and his Decameron to come to his idea of Canterbury Tales. We'll have much more to say about this in future lectures. The next heading, making it new. Chaucer, however, altered what he inherited. His pilgrims reflect almost all levels of society, from the knight to the miller. They are not fleeing from the plague. They are on a religious pilgrimage. Chaucer approach, Chaucer's approach allows him to exploit interesting differences between noble and base motives. For example, the wife of Beth may be on a pilgrimage not so much to worship at a saint's tomb as to meet her next husband. Chaucer uses each tale to reveal something about the teller. Notice the next heading, Inventing the Rhythm of English Poetry. Chaucer not only reinvented the frame story, he also reinvented a French verse form to create the iambic pentameter line that would dominate English poetry for hundreds of years. I would write that down. Chaucer is going to invent the iambic pentameter, ba-bum, 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 right? We'll see this over and over again, right? So, for example, the opening lines of, uh, uh, of uh, Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet, a pair of star-crossed lovers take their life. A pair of star-crossed lovers take their life. Ba-bum, 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 ba-bum. A uh, ba-bum is an iambic foot. Ba-bum, 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 ba-bum is five of them, pent, pent, for iambic pentameter. And we derive this from Chaucer, and he derives it from the French. Chaucer knew the ten-syllable uh, lines and rhyming couplets used in French poetry. With the instinct that comes only with real genius, he adapted that form to English. In his rhyming couplets, Chaucer used a line of ten syllables with five alternating accents, the form known as iambic pentameter. This new form, when rediscovered by poets in the 16th century, became one of the most enduring traditions in English literature. Let's just point out that from Chaucer's inventing, in many ways, or borrowing of the iambic pentameter, Shakespeare will borrow it. I just quoted you lines from Romeo and Juliet, the opening lines, in fact, of Romeo and Juliet. Tradition stretching backward and forward. Let's finish up. The beginnings of literature are lost in the midst of prehistory when some forms of telling stories came into being. Successive generations used those forms to relate the history of the tribe for each new generation. When these stories came down to be written down, traditional forms were established. The wonder of literature in this period is that we can see traditions stretching backward into archaeological time and stretching forward to tomorrow. Let's pay attention now finally to the essential question vocabulary. There's three there. I hope you have them in your notes on page 12. Make sure you have written down the word traditional of or relating to old customs, old ways of doing things. Inheritance, this is goods, ideas, literary creations, or skills received from the past. And make sure you have the word legend written down, a story which is handed down for generations and believed to be based on actual events. Page 13 is our final bit of work here and a contemporary connection. I just want to point out that I had mentioned something about this already. Let's just finish. Notice King Arthur, legendary hero, Broadway star. In medieval Europe, tales circulated of a legendary king named Arthur. He and his knights represented the ideas of chivalry, rules governing the behavior of knights, kind of like the Knight's Code. Since then, Arthur's story has surfaced in many literary and dramatic works. Most recently, it's been brought to life in Samplot, a musical comedy that pokes fun at the legends as follows. King Arthur's kingdom is a Las Vegas resort, not the town of Camelot. 
Or, the knights of the round table are a motley crew who have to be talked into performing heroic deeds. Or, Arthur's knights underwent trials and ordeals to prove their courage and virtue. Uh, Spamalot's uh, crew, however, must prove themselves by producing a Broadway musical. Despite its silliness, Spamalot's success proves the ongoing fascination with the legend, tales of romance, and courage never go out of style. Okay, there you go. An introduction to your reading. Uh, I hope that you have your notes ready for the exam. Thank you.